3, 13 to 19. 3, 13 to 19. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zila, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, it's the last Sunday of June already. Three months goes by really fast. I hope that you are not going to let your whole summer go by without considering how best to use it. I went to a pastor's meeting on this past Wednesday, and I said, hey guys, you have vacation plans? Because I really recommend it. And we had a great time while we were away. Um, we did not over plan, but this year I, I asked everybody to let us be known what it is they hope to see happen that week. Couldn't guarantee it would happen, but at least we'd all know where everybody was. And even though there were some changes in the plan along the way, it was a good plan. I mean, it was a good time to be together. My devotions yesterday were about how we don't like discipline, but we want to be disciplined. Think about that. No one likes to be disciplined by someone else, but we all want to say, I'm a disciplined person. We don't want the discipline, but we want what it will produce in our lives. But this summer will come and go, and you'll miss it and think, what? We have to take some, make some steps to plan for, make sure that you're working to enjoy it. Now, while I was on vacation, I did zoom into the elders meeting. There's only three things I did for work on vacation, and I knew I was going to do them. It was not that big of a deal. Uh, I like those guys, and I, I like watching them on the screen, and, and we, had, we had a good time. But during the meeting, um, Dial asked us all to consider what, if our mission is developing disciple makers, can we articulate what that means? And it's something that we've been talking about ever since we put that in, and we can talk a lot about discipleship. I was already planning on this message, making disciples the way Jesus did. Um, and that sounds a little arrogant, like I know. <laughs> uh, but we're going to look at the passage today. Ed has already read it. And we're going to look at that passage. And, and from that, we're going to Kind of leap into a couple of other messages before I get back to Galatians to finish out the summer. So if you just know where I'm headed with that. Um, someone sent me a note this week, evangelism is getting people into the lifeboat, discipleship is teaching them how to row. And I think that's the thing we, we do want to see people saved. But Jesus was not just interested in converts, he was interested in disciples. So we have to understand what does that mean. And I hope today I give you a lot of things to think about. Some will resonate with you, and others say, ah, it didn't quite fit. But you need to see where you are in your walk of discipleship with, with Jesus. Um, the, the message is coming up. This week is making disciples the way Jesus did. Next week, my plan is to sing patriotic songs. We don't always do that here. We're going to do that next week because 4th of July is actually on a Sunday. So we're going to do it. We're going to sing the patriotic songs. And I'm hoping I haven't even told the elders yet. yet I'm hoping to have each elder pray for a different aspect of our country. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. There's a verse that I'm looking at from Galatians, I think. And, and, and we're going to split that out and say, what is it that we seek in our country? That my side wins and the other side loses. Hmm. That's not what our founding fathers sought. They stood up for what they believed, but they wanted to see the unity and the freedoms being protected. And so we're going to pray for that for our nation. For as long as God gives us grace, we hope that we will have that. So that's next week. Patriotic songs and prayer and some, some scripture to, to just encourage us. You can almost say it's discipleship in America. <laughs> because sometimes we have an American way of looking at things that doesn't really fit the Bible too well. So we'll be talking about that. And then one of the discussions we've had numerous times. We have to share processes. Processes? To, for how you should be discipled. 
And I kind of back up and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, everybody's disciple differently. Everybody has a unique journey. And we can't just lock people into one plan. There's no one size fits all plan. But uh, Brother Scott, he, uh, he said, well, listen, when my son wanted to learn to play the trumpet, there were basic things at the beginning that every trumpet player needs to know. And then as he matured, so greatly as he matured as a trumpet player, he went in different directions. And he said recently, one of his professors, you have to learn to teach yourself. And I had just so many, it opened up my mind. So we're gonna be talking on the 11th about ongoing discipleship. That could be basic discipleship, that could be discipleship 101, heard it called a bunch of things. Just what are some of the key things? You don't grow beyond those. You, you put them into your life as disciplines and they should never go away. It's the ongoing discipleship things because if you don't do those, you're gonna drift away. And then we'll talk more about the maturing discipleship where one person is really gonna serve the Lord in their music and some people are gonna serve the Lord in teaching and loving children. Other people are gonna serve the Lord in a, in a cares ministry and helping people. Other people are gonna use uh, their gifts and we'll talk about that in, a moment, uh, in the message. So that's where we're going the next couple weeks. And then after that, uh, Dave Henry is gonna be here and we'll be leading right into our BBS and excited about uh, rekindling a lot of our burden as a church for, for children and youth work. So there's a lot of things we're praying about. I ask that you pray with us. Today, my proposition is this. The church must recommit herself to discipleship. I've been sharing some of the articles I've been reading Churches before COVID were very happy just to have a full church, have great music, and just have a lot of numbers. But one of the key men who started that whole approach said, we haven't been very good at making disciples. A crowded sanctuary does not mean we're disciples. So we need to recommit our, ourselves to discipleship. The church needs to commit herself to discipleship. And I hope today, through this passage in Mark, I want you to stay in Mark, just like Sean last week. I have a lot of verses, so they'll be on the screen. You don't have to flip around to those. They're all on the ESV, and hopefully you can follow along with that. But stay in Mark, because that's where I got the, the uh, skeleton of the, of the message, and then just pick some verses to support those thoughts that we see in Mark chapter three. So you know where we're going. I hope it's a, something you can apply. You can take to your life and say, this is the area where I need to seek out work on my discipleship. So let's pray before we look into the scriptures. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you love us, that you decided to initiate a call to sinful creation. You do it in so many ways, and, and I thank you that, that we have heard that call, at least to the point that we've come to church today. And we pray that we are on the frequency to hear your call. To hear that we could say speak lord for your servant here i pray that you would bless us as we look into your word that you would help us to realize so much has happened this past year and a half and we feel so out of control but you have never been out of control you have known everything that's happened and even though there are people that have looked at what you're doing and say i can't follow a god who will do that help us to see that you are a good god and you know exactly what you're doing and it all will work together for your good and we pray that we would see that and people that are hurting right now could see that. Bless us as we look into this idea of discipleship and guidance. Have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I ever say will hinder what your Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives today. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Discipleship begins with God's call. It's not something we can make happen. We can put ourselves in a position to allow God to work through what we're doing to call people, but we cannot initiate God's invasion of somebody's life. It's his work, and that's why prayer is so important. Discipleship begins with God's call. Now, when we do a Bible study and say, we're gonna do it the way Jesus did, that doesn't mean we all go to a mountain right now, right? You have to learn what to apply and what, to, you know, is that, that's what he did because that's their context. But the rest of it very much applies. He called to him 
those whom he desired, and they came to him. Do you know that no one could come to Jesus unless the Father draws him? John chapter 6, verse 44. I, I love this verse because it reminds me that anything good that happens comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So he initiates that call by drawing people to the Son. Uh, the Father draws people to the Son. Th think, think about this. Does he draw everybody? Well, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And creation calls to everybody. But we've done a really good job, especially in America, in our enlightenment to just totally dismiss the need for a creator. And therefore, we've turned off that frequency. We're not looking at the beauty of creation and, and saying, thank you, God. We're saying, oh, what a great happy accident that it all came together. That's not the way I want to live, and we can point that out to people. Do you really, really think? We don't have to argue with them. Do you really, really think all of this intricacies, just of your eye, just all the things that had to come together to give you sight, do you think that just happened by accident? It, it's foolish. And if you just lovingly confront that, because I believe God calls to all people, not just through creation, he calls through relationships. People will come into your life and they'll say something and it'll make a difference. He calls through the church. He calls through many things, the beautiful music that we have. But see, there's another call out there too, saying none of it's true, don't believe it. It'll never, it'll never give you what you want. And the reality is the thing that you need is what the creator created you to need. And he's the only one who can give it to you. So we need to know that the Father draws people to the Son. No one's going to get saved unless God does a work in their life. And I hope you can agree with that. So then, well then, how do I know who he's going to call? Well, I said, I believe he calls everybody to some point. And, and I see that in 1 Timothy 2.4. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So how do I participate in that? Keep speaking truth. You don't have to worry about combating everybody else's lies. You spend a lot of time going out and saying, that's not true, that's not true. That's true. Just start lifting up the truth. Remembering Jesus said he himself is the truth. Keep lifting up Jesus and let the truth, because that's how people are going to be called. That's how people are going to respond. And then John 640, which is a little before that other verse that we just looked, John 644, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Everyone who comes must believe. So you can come to church, and you can act the part, but if you've not come to faith that Jesus is the very Son of God, that Jesus lived a perfect life and died for your sins, and he rose again on the third day, and that is the only way for you to experience forgiveness of your sins. If you do not yet believe that, then you are not yet called, completely called to your salvation. God's knocking. He wants you to hear that, that he has a, a gift to give you, but you have to receive it. You have to believe it. John 1, 12, I quote a lot too. Uh, but as many as received him, even to those that believed on his name, he gives the right to become the children of God. Now I want to read a verse that's very familiar. Matter of fact, we, we went out to eat a lot on our vacation. And when I, whenever I don't have a track, and I, many times I don't, on the slip, I'll write three, you maybe heard me say this, I'll write three references down. First, JN316. Everybody knows that means something. And then I write JN146, which is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then I write jn 112, but as many as received him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. I don't know if anybody has read through. They say, well, that must be in the Bible. I know John 3.16 says, I'm going to look those two up. Who knows? But it's my effort. It's something that to know this. Well, John 3.16, people know, um, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then verse 17 says, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. But look at what verse 18 says. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Do you know you're born condemned in your sin? You were born condemned in your sin. That's why in this passage, 
Jesus said you have to be born again through faith. And when you're born again, you are no longer condemned. Amen. Now, this sounds so, some people that don't understand say, how can you claim that Jesus is the only way? Will you show me one other religious teacher that prophesied his death and resurrection and then accomplished it? And we can talk. He proved it. He proved it with his works, and specifically the sign of Jonah, he told the people, that in three days he'll be in the, in the earth, and on the third day he'll rise again. So we, without apology, need to share that truth, knowing that we cannot convince people by our words to accept Jesus. We can only share the truth and then pray that the Spirit is drawing them and that their heart will open and be saved. Discipleship begins at that point. We got to get him under the boat before we start teaching him to rock. So we, we see this. Discipleship begins with God's call. Now the first part of verse 14. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. How many of you know what apostle means? Sent one. But before he sends them, he wants something else. What's the that last phrase there, so that they might be with him. Discipleship is a call to relationship. It begins with God's call, and the first part of that call is to have a relationship with Jesus. Discipleship is a relationship. It's a call to a relationship. In the end, right before he was to go to the cross, Jesus had that beautiful time in the upper room with his disciples. And in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he, is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you could do nothing. I'm leaving. He's already telling me, I'm leaving. But you can still abide in me, because I'm the vine. You're the branches. You need to maintain that connection point with me, because without me, you can do nothing. We need to see that. That, that he truly truly is the relationship that we need to pursue above all relationships. That song Jesus calls us. We have cares, we have blessings, and Jesus says, love me more than those. Love me more than those. That's, the, the, again, the message that Sean shared the last two weeks, the greatest command, that we need to truly love him. Jesus calls us to abide. We also see in Acts 4, 13, now when they had the when they saw the religious leaders, they're calling Peter and John to them, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Abiding in Christ produces fruit. It produces a change in your life. I could just see, I, as Jesus was in heaven watching these two, that he struggled with for those three years, almost three years. And I could almost say, mission accomplished. They spent time with me, even my enemies recognized because they spent time with me, they are changed. That's a beautiful testimony. And I wish I had more of that testimony because I am still struggling with temper and struggling with emotions that, that and I realize it's not that I'm not growing, it's just that every day I fail to abide in Christ, the temper can come out. Now, that doesn't mean that because I have great devotions, I'm not going to get angry, because I can get done with my devotions and get right angry. I mean, it's just the way sin is. My flesh is a struggle. But I know the battle. I'm joining the battle. I continue in the battle. And I do see that he is seeking to change me, to make a difference in me. And I, I use temper. temper. There's other things I don't tell you about in my life. <laughs> But you all have things in your life too. You have to be with Jesus and let people see the difference that that makes in your life. Abiding in Christ produces fruit. And then James 4 8. I love this one when I put this together. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Oh, that's for the pious and the religious, right? Who's he talking about? Who's he talking to? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, is this a call to salvation? No. I think it's a call to believers who realize they have not been abiding and have not been spending time with Jesus, and they're ashamed because of their failures 
And he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's waiting to draw near to you. Don't ever let the enemy say, you're too far gone. You're too far gone. You're just too much of a mess. God can't use you. That's what he wants you to believe. You keep coming back. You keep drawing near. God draws near to repentance sinners. In, in another verse that I, I looked in in Acts, uh, Peter, when he's preaching the second time, after he healed the lame man, he says, repent, repent, and there will be times of refreshing. So all the anguish of, of your past and your, your struggles, there could be a refreshment. There could be as you repent and receive God's forgiveness, you can be refreshed. That, that's what we need to see. God calls us to abide. Abiding produces fruit. And even when you fail in that, he is waiting for you to draw near to him because he draws near to repenting of sinners. Re Revelation 3.20, another verse that we quote often in relationship to salvation. We've all seen the picture. There's no handle on the outside. Jesus can't get in until the person inside opens the door. That's the, the picture. You've heard many sermons on that. This was a message to the church. This was a message to believers. It's not just about, you already have a relationship with Jesus, but you say, don't forget to invite me. Don't forget to invite me. And I, I don't think I've shared this. I shared it with a couple of people, but not from the pulpit. We had the great, crazy grace party. My wife and I were driving up from Maryland and we're, and we're seeing the rain. We're driving through some pretty heavy rain. And I knew Jason was very concerned about the rain. And I told him this story. When you do an outdoor event, we saw a Hawaiian pastor at a conference once. And he said, I had this big church event planned and I begged God not to let it rain. And I prayed and I prayed and, and it rained. And I went back to God and said, why? He said, you know, you never once invited me to your event. All you did was pray that I'd stop it from raining. And, and praise the Lord. It rained a little bit, but they were able to do things that, 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 that if you didn't see it, there was a balloon thing for shooting baskets. It was awesome. And you unplug it, it drops. You plug it in, one minute later, it's all full and you can view it. And, and they, they enjoyed it. The key is... Jesus wants to be with us. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I, come, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He wants to fellowship with you. Don't. My daughter used to say, I can just imagine Jesus waiting at the foot of my bed for me to wake up because he wants to spend time with me. That, that's the picture that we see here. So discipleship begins with God's call on your life. Discipleship is a call to relationship, not religion. It's a call to relationship. <clears throat> Moving to the, the last part of Mark chapter 3, verse 14. And he might send them out to preach. We already called them apostles, which means sent ones. So he is sending them out to preach. Discipleship is also a call to service. Discipleship is a call to service. And I have been in church ministry long enough to know that I have a very short-sighted view sometimes of what service is. Well, right now we need you to do this. So that must be the way God's calling you to serve. You can serve in many, many, many ways. You can serve in many ways. Sometimes it'll be with the children's ministry. Sometimes it'll be with the youth ministry. Sometimes it'll be in music. Sometimes it'll be just keeping this building together. There are many ways to serve God. It all will happen in prayer. If nothing else, you can take those prayer sheets, look at the prayer list in your bulletin, and you can be praying for the needs of those in our church. And I know so many are. And I pray their tribe increases that we can pray. You also need to give. I don't preach much about giving, although Jesus talked a lot about it, the Bible talks a lot about it. That's, that's one of the clear ways you can see how close you are to God by how you treat the things he's blessed you with. Amen. And you, you take that and you say, Lord, it's all yours. Help me to be a good steward of it. So there are many ways that we can serve. Mark 16, 15 says, this is uh, Mark's version of the uh, Great Commission. 
And he said to them, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Do you proclaim good news where you go? And I'm not just talking about the Romans road and the plan of salvation. That is good news. And you need to work on that. You want to open up doors and see God open up doors for you to share that truth. But many times you just need to share a moment of good news to somebody that needs to hear good news. You can't always get the whole plan of salvation out in a, in a quick conversation. I, I went to the pool on Saturday and uh, was thinking about discipline and all those things. I worked harder than I've worked since I started going back after the pandemic, uh, after they've opened that the pandemic. Um, and I worked hard and I, I felt it. And I talked with, there were some people that hadn't been back since it opened. And it was great to connect with them again. But then I did what I like to do when I have time to go over to sit in the hot tub. And at first I was alone in this very thin man. He said, why do you have to go to a gym? You're thin, what are you doing here? I didn't say that. But he, he got into the jacuzzi out of the, the uh, hot tub and, and he, he sat down and just smiled and said hello. And then I said, you know, you're, you're pretty good because he had been in the hot tub, then he got into the cold pool and then he came back to the hot tub. I said, that step from the hot tub to there is, is one that I just, more power to you, I can't do that. Once, once I get warm, I don't want to get back into that. And all of a sudden he said to me, oh, how I wish I'd have spent more time with my wife when she wanted to go swimming. Oh. And I just kind of listened a little bit more and he said, um, she always wanted to go swimming with me, but I had my routine. And I was too busy doing what I wanted to do in the pool. And now that she's gone. I think he was discipling me. You might have seen my ring. If you're here alone, you know, do you do, you, do, you do things with your wife? He might have been discipling me about that. But I heard a man who was really sad and wondering, you know, with such regret. And I tried to share with him, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of regret that people have. And I shared about uh, a, a, a nice, wonderful couple that uh, the man just recently lost his wife. And just the life that they had together. No one does it perfectly. And you have to know that there is a God who forgives us when we drop the ball. And, and I just shared just a little, just a little bit. And just, I don't I hope to see him again. I have seen him. The interesting thing is he's tall and thin. He doesn't look old, but he was 70 years old. Now, you don't look 70 to me. But, but we have good news to share. And he doesn't have to live in remorse. You know, again, the, the greater your memories of a loved one, the greater the grief. But, but you don't have to beat yourself up over that. You're learning a lesson. And I, I should have thanked him for telling me that. You know, telling me because I need to remember that because my wife's still here. And to, to not just do my own thing. So we need to proclaim the good news. The good news will start where people are and lead them to the cross. And we need to ask the Spirit to open up those avenues to do that. We also need to minister comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 favorite verse. God comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I think about those people that are waiting to find out what happened to their loved one down in Florida. I think about, you know, Samaritan's Purse is really good at this. It wants to share, they want to share the gospel but sometimes when people are in pain and agony or they're hungry and all, it's hard for them to hear. So we minister comfort. We minister comfort and then see God open the doors for the good news that we can proclaim. We have to follow God in that. We need to, to follow what he wants us to do as he calls us to serve. And then 1 Peter 4.10, 1 Peter 4.10 as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. You know, God gives us each different gifts. And I'm not even talking about spiritual gifts. That list is a good list. But he gives each of us unique talents. He gives us each of us a, a unique personality. He, he has shaped each one of us. And we need to take what we understand God has given us and find out how we can best share it with we need to minister grace. We need to serve according to God's 
very grace. And then I'll close that point with this. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. I remind myself of this a lot. When I'm serving in the church, I'm not just serving the church. I'm not just serving an individual in the church. I am serving the Lord who loves the church and he loves each one of you. And if I've been able to, to be a part of that, what God's seeking to do, that's the excitement. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Another recent devotional. How can you say you love God and hate your neighbor? God loves your neighbor. God loves. And we, need, we, we have to understand his desire to express his love through you, even if it's hard. So discipleship begins with God's call. Discipleship is a call to relationship. Discipleship is a call to service. Finally, discipleship is a call to spiritual warfare. Verse 15, that they would have authority to cast out demons. I, I don't quite know the condition of the earth before Christ came. I know that there's so many people that will really go take until the Lord finally came that just Satan really had a strong hold. And then we talk about he was the prince of this world. And Jesus said he was cast out when Jesus died on the cross. He's still now he's the prince of the power of the air. Wherever he is, he has a lot of power. But I think of all the demonically uh, the demon-possessed people that Jesus confronted. Think of Mary Magdalene, if you've seen The Chosen. Just her story in that, that series is just amazing. That there's a spiritual war. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, when, how, when I was in Ephesians, months ago now, um, when I, I showed that picture of Syria looking out a hole from the wall that had been blown there through a, a shell or some sort of uh, warfare, and he just looked out to a, a total war zone. And we need to have that thought. Every day we walk out of our house, we are entering a war zone. And we better be prepared for it. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We need God's might. We need God's armor. I, what, the week I wasn't here, I, I believe... Jerry Joe talks to kids as I'm in the Lord's army and talk about God's armor for the kids. It's something that they can see. We have to understand that we need his might and we need to put on his armor. We live in a war zone. 1 Peter 5 8. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We need to be watchful, we need to be alert. We shouldn't be surprised at the things that Satan is doing in, in our life and in the lives of those around us. We need to be alert. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We need to submit and resist. Do you submit and resist? Do you do it the right way? Sometimes we resist God and submit to the devil. God's never going to flee from you, by the way. He's going to keep working to draw you to repentance. We need to submit to God and resist the devil. And he says he will flee. Do you recognize the spiritual warfare that you're involved in? And as the time gets closer, it's going to intensify. I don't even know what I mean by that, but I just believe it, that it gets worse. In fact, I've been thinking about someone that's really struggling with how God has been working in their lives. And, and, and I think, well, look at the Apostle Paul. Could anyone be more of a committed believer than the Apostle Paul? I, I, I don't know how to even compare that, but he's definitely one of the top ones. And you read in Corinthians all the bad things that happened to him. And he knows it's part of God's plan. And he's thankful for it. Didn't like it at the time. Being shipwrecked three times is not a fun thing, I'm sure. And all the beatings and the and stone to death at one point. And he still got up. So we shouldn't expect that, well, in my discipleship journey, I expect only good things. We 
we live in a war zone. We live in a war zone, and we can't, you can try to hide from it, but it's gonna, it's gonna overtake you. And it's interesting, this James 4, 7 passage, I already referred to James 4, 8. If we are failing to submit, therefore, to God and resist the devil, and he's not fleeing from you, James 4, 8, the verse that follows says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. He's waiting for you to repent. Some good verses other than Ephesians uh, 6 about warfare, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I love this because first of all, our battle is not with flesh. We do wrestle with our own flesh, but we're not wrestling with others in their, their flesh. That's, that's between God and them. Our battle is with the enemy. Our battle is with powers in, in, Satan's, in, in Satan's army, the demons, and the principalities, and so forth. Our weapons of warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power. So how do we do it in verse 5? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. I believe Satan's desire is to kill and murder anything that God loves. And I believe his way of doing it is he's the father of all lies. So it is the truth that will keep us fighting properly. We need to continue to fill our lives with the truth and walk in the truth. Four ideas about discipleship we've shared. Discipleship begins with God's call. Discipleship is a call to relationship. It's a call to service. And it's a call to spiritual warfare. I want to conclude with this. Discipleship is still personal. Discipleship is still personal. Um, when Ed read that list of names and just recognize, I'll read it now, 16 through 19. He appointed the 12, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter. Boy, there's a story there, isn't there? James, the son of Zebedee, he's the one that died really soon after the Holy Spirit came. I said, what a waste. He was saw all those things, God. Why'd you take him home so early? Why'd you let him be the first martyr? Why did you do that? Because God has his plan. And then John, who lived longer than any of the apostles. And they were called the sons of thunder. I learned how to say that word, Ed, but then I've already forgotten, so I'm not going to try <laughs> Verse 18, Andrew. Andrew's the one who brought Peter. Philip. We think about, I always get him confused with the deacon Philip in Acts. Um, but Bartholomew, there's a story with every one of these. And Jesus uniquely loved and discipled each one of them personally. They had basic lessons and ongoing lessons that they needed to hold, lay hold of. And then he worked with them. Matthew, if you've seen the chosen, you need to, I just fall in love with, it, with the, the disciple Matthew in that story. And if you've ever seen Monk, the, that show Monk, that's exactly what he's patterned after. And it's just, it's just an interesting thing to, to watch. Thomas, the doubter, James, the, Alf, the son of Alphaeus, I think he's the James the Less. How would you like to know that? Might have meant he was short. Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, I always think, how did Simon the Zealot get along with Matthew the tax collector? And then Judas Iscariot. Remember I said, you can come, but you also have to believe. He came, he followed for a long time, but he didn't believe. See, there's a story here because discipleship is personal. Each disciple is unique, but we are all called by God to a growing relationship, to opportunities for service, to stand firm in spiritual warfare. I, I, I assure you that is true of each one of us, even though our walk of discipleship is unique. Now I want to close with just this picture. Tonight we're talking about the, uh, well, it's a town hall. We'll talk about what you want to talk about. But uh, the, if you haven't picked up a copy of the the uh, job description we have for the assistant pastor of CE and youth, youth and CE ministries, 
Uh, this is something that I was taught when I went to school. I don't. I, I ask myself, are they teaching new things now? Because <laughs> the world has changed so much. Well, this is still true because it's based on what Jesus was doing. There are different types of people, and you have to find out where they are. There are community people in our community who are not at all connected with God or our church. They have no knowledge of our existence. That's why we go to Palmer Davis to just introduce ourselves and let people know we're here. There are people in the crowd that will show up to an event every so. Oh, I remember that church. We went there for a concert. We went there for the. Yeah, I know you. And you never know how well that'll uh, what that'll lead to. I know we have VBS coming up, and I remember the Masics, and when they realized that the church they were attending was just, they were too in disagreement with that church, the dad or the mom, I don't know who said it first, let's go to the church where our daughter went to VBS. And they came, and he served on our boards before they moved out of the area. Just, it's just such a neat story. So there are people that are acquainted, we need to pray, not just for the church, but I'll get to that in a second, but that they come to know Jesus, not just become acquainted with him. In fact, the danger is they'll hear enough about Jesus to become inoculated from him. They'll just get enough and say, oh, I think I know who that is, and they never really know who he is. And then the church, those are people that are attending. Now, attendance can be judged by different people, by how much is enough attendance. You've heard me say this before, I read it, and it opened my mind up. It used to be that faithful church attendance was three times a week. Now it's three times a month. And then it's just, we're a busier society. That's not wrong per se. It's just to recognize. But people will call this their church even though they show up twice a year. You know, I'm, I'm church. Yeah, that's my church. But again, it's not about church. It's about where they are with Christ. Because the next thing we'll say is congregation. People that are actually saved. I always wonder how many people come to this church semi-regularly and they still haven't responded to the gospel message. They're just coming to church. And I think our our evangelism needs to be more than just invite people to church. That, that can be part of it. But we need to be talking about who Jesus is because our church will let about. Someone came and talked about some things, and I said, well, just be assured we're going to let you down too. We don't intend to, but it's just that way people are. And then finally, the core. The core. When Jason wanted to have the crazy grace party, I reminded him of a story that was taught by one of the professors at school. He brought in a special speaker to do this big event for a youth group. And when they all got there, no one came. And the special speaker said, well, where's your core? I said, what's a core? And he said, well, let me, let me take the time you brought me in. Let me take the time to teach you how Jesus did ministry. And the core are those people that you know are going to be there, that you know are ready to serve, that they're ready to lead and take responsibility. Those that we need, we need those people. As we open up new ministries, if we don't have somebody that's a core person to do that, we're not going to open open them up. We did have an event, but we're not. We don't yet have a youth ministry. That was just an event. But but and I, I said, Jason, I, I I'm not even going to be there. I, I'm going to be on vacation. He said, if just 10 people come, and if you haven't heard, about 40 plus showed up from different places. Now, the purpose of that was to open up the reminder that if we solidify these ministries, there are people ready to be ministered to. And it should motivate us as we continue on this track of hiring somebody and finding out. But if we hire somebody tomorrow, he still needs volunteers to come alongside him. So we need to see that service a component to that. I also, this week, um, if you saw the vehicles out there, who knows who they belong to? The streets, all right? It was just Tonda and Hannah and Isaiah and his new wife, Brigitte, that came this, the beginning. When they come back, the whole team is coming back. You'll be hearing more about that. I do need some of the drive to JFK. Oh, what does it say? I, I really am not doing this, folks. Um, it's July 22nd. I need someone that can drive in to, just to take the van and the trailer and pick them up on July 22nd. So please, if you like city driving, <laughs> let me know of your interest. Scott took Hannah and Tonda and Isaiah and Brigitte to Newark. 
because of the COVID laws and all the things, he had to really put this trip together uniquely. So he took them there. And I think, what's the purpose of taking a bunch of kids on a, on a missions trip? It, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Well, there's a couple of purposes. One, it trains the core. They are going to be trained for the things that they can do in ministry. And they can see. And, and Jeff and Tonda are awesome in just living their life before those kids and discipling them. It also reaches people in Senegal. That's where they're headed. That's where they are, Lord willing. And, and just there's a ministry that they have there. And if you've heard their story, they will be here uh, the 20, they get in the 25th, 26th, 27th. I, that, I don't have the right dates, but they will be here. You've heard them tell stories. Sometimes all they do is they'll go to a community and pick up trash. And it is a testimony to that community. And, and, and that opens other doors for the missionary that they're with at the time. So there's many ways that, that, that God can use us. As we close, I'm going to close in prayer. So God's going to come lead us in our last hymn, which is a real hymn of commitment. It's a beautiful hymn by Gloria Gaither. I want you to consider afterwards, we're going to sit down, time of silence. Leave the last slide on the screen if you could. It's still there. And I want you to consider where you fit in that list. And then I want you to consider the people that you know. Where do they fit in that list? And one of the things we're going to ask our assistant pastor to do is to acknowledge children and youth and see where they fit and then build ministry bridges to help them along their path. Many times you go into a church and the first thing you have to do is fulfill everybody's ex expectation. And you never really get to the business of what you think God is calling you to do. That's, that's important. We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. So I'm going to close in prayer and all the things that I've just said Lord willing will happen. And after a time of, of, of silence before the Lord, uh, we will, I'll pronounce the benediction. Father, I praise you. I praise you for your great love. Jesus, I praise you for coming to this earth and calling disciples to yourself. Dear Holy Spirit, I thank you for indwelling believers and persevering with us even though we grieve and quench you. I thank you that it's your work, but I pray that we'd be more in tune with you as disciples of Christ and that we'd be able to reach those that need to hear the gospel and they need to grow as a disciple of Christ as well. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Number 604, let's stand and sing. <laughs>
And now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing in him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.